I'm going to start the year then with uh, a story which I hinted at last year, but which um, is something that has been sort of bubbling on the, on the back of the stove for quite some time. So when you get the transcript, you'll see that I refer to a report that came out in 2016, and it was part of a UN environment report that was looking at emerging issues, which is what this series is all about, frontiers. And what it was trying to do at the time was to raise a flag on issues that I felt at that time as the UN chief scientist people should be paying attention to. And at the time, it caused quite a stir. People got worried, and it coincided with some events in the maize and, and corn markets where people were dying because they had, uh, they had eaten contaminated food. Uh, but then it just kind of disappeared. I guess with all the other things that people fret about, including Brexit, it kind of went off the horizon. And so I was slightly perplexed by this because if there's anything that people care about more than anything, it's really the food that they're eating as well as the air they breathe. So I went back again and I looked to see how much more evidence, how much more research had been done. And it's kind of an interesting thing. And you'll see as I go through the lecture that the, all the signs are there of this being a very, very important issue. But somehow it hasn't got picked up again. So I'm hoping that with this lecture, we can kind of kickstart a conversation. And it's not just about food safety. It's about a recognition that plants like the rest of us, don't just sit idly around thinking, oh, the climate is changing and waiting to die. No, actually plants adapt. And one of the things that you'll hear about today and tonight is that as they adapt, they actually become poisonous to humans and to animals. So the story is going to unravel a little bit as we get towards the end, because it's about, well, well what can we do? And we're just making it worse with some of our farming practices. So we'll get into that. So I'm going to start out, though, because since that report was written, we then had the report from the Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which basically looked at the possibility that we could arrive with some new implementation and some more kind of energy put into the system with commitments that would keep the global average temperature at 1.5 degrees above industrial levels. Now, up until this report, it had been widely agreed that the negotiations were all about two degrees. Nevertheless, there was a concerted effort because the difference between 1.5 degrees on average and two degrees on average is actually very significant. And it's certainly significant in the Arctic regions, but it's very, very important also in sub-Saharan Africa and a kind of whole swath of countries around the equator. So when the report came out, by then, people began to realise that this was a point of diminishing return. We were getting further and further away from the possibility of achieving it. Nevertheless, it made quite a splash. And people began to understand that the difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees on average actually would lead to a number of very significant effects. So just to briefly think about what it means... If you go to sub-Saharan Africa, now most of you will realise that in sub-Saharan Africa we're talking about a lot of climate extremes over the last three decades. We've had droughts, we have floods, we have many, many things happening. And in that space between 15 degrees north and 15 degrees south is where you have an increasingly uh, dependent population on rain-fed agriculture and livestock that is feeling the real pressure of climate change. I'm not saying that poverty is increasing, but it is extremely stressful living in this domain if your main source of livelihood are actually the crops that you manage to grow and the livestock that you sustain. So we would call this a climate change hotspot. And it's no point thinking of the future, particularly when we think about development and all the sort of ideas about bringing people from poverty, leaving no one behind if you don't really look climate change squarely in the face and think hard about, well, what does it take to survive? So if we think about it, we see that there's going to be crop losses, yields are going to go down, there will be catastrophic failures of some crops. If we go to the western side of Africa, so you can see in this picture, 
These are kind of these are selective climate anomalies. But if we go to Africa, what you see already, even in June 2018, uh, it was the fourth highest June since the beginning of the previous century. So we just see again and again records being broken. But all over the world, when it comes to temperature, you can see that all places are really being touched by this. The Arctic sea ice, I'm sure many of you know, is diminishing. Sea, the sea surface itself is warming up. Uh, I think even today there was news of some of these large heat events and the impacts on the oceans. They're far more prevalent than we had thought. So this picture across the world um, really manifests itself in many ways. In Australia, we have massive fires and so on. Now, around the world, what we encounter are kind of two approaches. One approach is very technology driven, um, essentially taking humans out of harm's way and trying to fireproof essentially the world if you live in, in the place where you, there are wildfires or make sure that you have sufficient water through various means and so forth. But in every instance, and I, I would take the Australian outback as an example, where there are huge potential bushfires every year, what the Aboriginal peoples had in their minds traditionally was that they would set fires early on in the season, realizing that they needed to get rid of the, of the bush, of the brush. And for 20 or 30 years, burning of wood was banned. Essentially, the Australian government felt this was not a thing to be doing. And what happened was, of course, all of the brush began to build up, there was tinder, and then there were massive conflagrations. And with that went essentially the food because animals were killed, crops were lost and so forth. Recently, there's been a reintroduction of this idea of doing small burns all the way through the early part of the season so that when you have this long period of dry uh, and drought, then effectively you've got rid of a lot of the tinder from within the forests. Now that kind of community, that sort of learning and that knowledge can be found all over the world. The challenge that we see though is that the seeds themselves have changed fundamentally within the marketplace. So when we look around the world at what's been happening and we look at, for example, the hunger map for 2017, most of the reason for the hunger map, if you take away conflicts and you take away the fact that people can't get access to their farmlands, is to do with the fact that there's a very, very limited number of varieties of seeds that people have available to grow. Why is that? Well, we've got large companies that have dominated the agricultural landscape. And in a way, the governments who have, in a sense, been home to those entities have turned the wheels of government and investment such that everything from the growing through the processing to the supply chain is all geared to an extremely small number of varieties. And we're talking about the basics of rice, of corn, of sorghum, and so forth. If we look at the hunger map then, you have to kind of imagine what it's like on the ground. So in 2017, there was a drought, a very, very bad drought, particularly in Africa. And so you can see that Sudan, Chad, Ethiopia, um, even uh, sort of coming down towards Tanzania, little, and certainly in, in Kenya, Uganda, all the way through there, effectively, you had hunger. And there are different... Um, there are different sort of classifications, but essentially it's the prevalent of undernourishment in the population. So anything that's very dark brown is very high, 35% and over. So imagine that you're in Uganda of all places, and one third of the population is basically starving. And even if you were in Kenya, which is where I was, um, it was certainly at the high end. It was very close to one third of the population. Now, move forward one more year, and you can see a small change in the map. You see that Ethiopia and Kenya are essentially in the 15 to 25%, but that's still a lot of people who are effectively undernourished. So the reasons and the causes, they do change, and they are, in a sense, 
caught up. Drought is one of the major drivers, but it, then it gets, it gets caught up in civil war, internal displacements, access to land, and so forth. But at the very, very root of many of the issues around hunger, it is the fact that the plant varieties that are being grown, uh, I would say in the mass production field, are simply not set up to deal with drought conditions. So if I was to read through a whole list of countries in Africa in 2018, although it may not show itself across the whole of a country, the list is quite astonishing. So Burundi, Malawi, Niger, Lesotho, Cap Verde, Guinea, Eswatini, Liberia, Mauritania, Uganda, all had localized but extensive crop production shortfalls for significant periods of the year. Djibouti, a series of very unfavorable rainy seasons, which meant that nearly 200,000 people were severely food insecure. Madagascar, 1.3 million people literally did not have food for long periods of 2018. And then, of course, prices went up, supply chains collapsed, and so on. In Chad, okay, there was uh, internal displacement, there was a civil war, but still the crops were failing. In Kenya, it was a, a, it was a kind of short call, a, a very tight call between uh, whether the losses for the crops or the losses from livestock were going to outcompete each other. Together, it was calamitous. Essentially, animals were just dropping on the ground. Ethiopia, well, we know. Ethiopia has a, a dreadful track record. It's the largest recipient of food aid. Right now, we've got nearly 8 million people affected by food insecurity. So these things are systemic and they're deeply, deeply embedded in the whole way of thinking about the countries themselves. Mozambique, you can see, is in the dark there. Dry conditions led by, uh, followed by pest infestations and so on and so forth. Senegal, not quite so bad, but it was appearing on the map for the first time. Somalia, another 2 million people, 1.6 people affected. So if you've ever lived through a drought, it's a, it's a really harrowing experience. And if you live in a part of the world where drought just seems to be there the whole time, and maybe it wasn't there before, you can really understand why people essentially say, I might just as well leave and walk, and maybe walk hundreds of kilometers, because there's no point in staying. So, I want to just show you a very short film about the drought in Kenya because it was a mixture of livestock, very, very valuable part of someone's life, their assets, and what people were saying about it. And they were really quite confused. Was it a humanitarian crisis? Well, in real terms, it was. People were genuinely suffering. But there was always this sense, particularly amongst the Maasai and other tribes who are pastoralists, that somehow something was going to come to the rescue. But as you can see from this little boy, out to the horizon, everything's just dead. Everything. Oh. This is like an emergency. We lost many animals. We have never seen such a death. Even in 2011, 2005, we have never experienced such a high number of livestock dying in mass. And the pastoralists have lost a lot. Their livelihood is now threatened. Some of them will become dropouts from pastoral livelihoods, will come around the urban areas and start to look for cashewa. I think we will have a lot of pastoral dropouts. If the situation continues like this, I'm sure it will be a catastrophe. We might lose lives, not, not livestock lives this time, but I fear for even human life, because the situation is really, really bad. Over 90% of the population depend on hard dams for their water, but over 95% of our hard dams are dry. Uh, currently, over 95% of our population are dependent on boreholes, and these boreholes also, with a drought like this, uh, normally the water level tends to go down. So we are left with, us, with a few strategic boreholes.
where the entire population tend to crowd around. The current drought has made it difficult for mothers to get proper food, which they can eat and in turn provide nutrients to their babies in the form of milk. This little boy is not alone. He is one of five children who are severely malnourished. The other 41 are acutely malnourished and the condition is getting worse. Uh, one of the um, infectious diseases, number one, is upper resp respiratory infections, then uh, followed by diarrhea because they're drinking dirty water that is not treated, which, I mean, from the riverbed. Also, there is a, l there is a lot of um, uh, eye sickness because there are flies all over that are going into their eyes. <coughs> Mothers have been forced to rise early in the morning to go and fetch water, to cover a distance of about 20 kilometers every day with their donkeys. And if you look at actually what has been happening, many a times, there, there are times even, 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 even the, norm, the, the school feeding program cannot run as usual. Because at times, they feel it's difficult for them even to get this water. Because first of all, they need to start with what they need at the household level. It has been said that decades ago, Kenya experienced drought once every 10 years. But lately, that has changed, and every two to three years, several parts of the country are experiencing drought. There are 23 counties going through this most difficult time of their lives, and they have lost hope. And the hope we can bring to them is to provide emergency funding to be able to provide food for them at this moment in time. At the moment, close to 277,000 people in Turkana are in dire need of food and water. One in every 10 people here is actually facing starvation. There are cases of people hanging themselves, abandoning homes, children leaving school. Most of them will not go back once the school opens because there is no animal to sell for them so that they can go back. So the condition is there. The weather experts are also painting a very gloomy picture ahead. The long-awaited long rainy season will not be sufficient. So the numbers of people affected by drought nationally are projected to reach 4 million, up from 2.7 million. So our appeal is let's focus on climate change. But in this particular instance, we are appealing to the humanitarian community, to and various donor community, and even Kenyans, loving Kenyans, to donate to this way the cause. So now the problem is that when you see your livestock dying and the crops have failed, you will have noticed there are a few plants around. And the next thing that we observed and I observed was that you would find people literally lying on the side of the road and you would, you know, what's happening now? What, what's, what's this? And obviously they were malnourished, but not sufficiently that you would think that they had died from, from that particular cause. And it became apparent that we were seeing this again and again, particularly in Ethiopia. And the sort of diagnostics were people were literally staggering along the side of the road. Then they would complain that they, they couldn't see and they were vomiting. Their livestock were showing many of the same symptoms. And that's really what alerted people to the fact that, yes, the animals are dying, because effectively there's a drought and they can't get fodder. But the, the animals are also dying because they're eating the plants that have adapted to climate change. So this process of sort of a drought mechanism in plants has begun to really start to take off. People are asking questions. Now, there are some really old fashioned uh, ways of thinking about how plants respond. And you'll see on the left-hand side, you know, if you've been to school, you'll remember, you know, that when there's less water around, the plant puts down a deeper root. Uh, it can roll its leaves. Um, stems become waxier to try retaining the water inside the plant. So, you know, there's a kind of an avoidance process. Then there's tolerance. Um, you can have all kinds of organisms and plants in particular that develop a tolerance, 
So they might change internally the osmosis, so they're adjusting how much water they're losing through evapotranspiration, how much they're keeping inside the plant. Um, then you have escape. So uh, uh, plants really trying to go through the business of reproduction before they actually are hit by heat stress, uh, and so on and so forth. So this is a rather what I would call a sort of traditional picture, nevertheless being reinforced again and again. So what the marketplace starts to think about is, well, OK, maybe we should start breeding for traits in our crops that go for some of these mechanisms. So you see amongst the sorghum growers um, looking for trying to put waxiness into plants and so on. So in a way, that's a very technological response. Can we design plants that are drought resistant? Um, but when we think about what's happening inside the plant for all sorts of purposes, you can see that critically you have different stages. Okay? You have the vegetative growth, the reproductive growth, and maturity. And what is really quite significant is that we see the process of reproduction is being considerably distorted because of the extra heat. So as it becomes hotter in the nighttime, those temperatures carry through. And so the plants are showing all kinds of signs in their reproductive organs, the stamen and so forth, that they're not as resilient to drought or to heat. So they're both suffering from a lack of water and also heat stress. Pollinators then start to get implicated because they're actually a, un unable to sort of pollinate the plants as well. So there's multiple, multiple things. But what we're seeing more and more is that the heat and the drought are actually affecting this part in the middle, the kind of flowering drought, the pollen fer fertility and the viability. And the sets, the seed sets, are not actually as effective as they should be. So behind the scenes, then, you have something which has to do with uh, cyanogenesis, cyanic, uh, hydrocyanic uh, acid, pr prussic acid. So two re researchers here, actually, in the UK, um, were out looking at the impacts of the drought. Now, I don't know how many remember, but the drought in 75, 76 was pretty extreme. And they were on this place called Robinswood Hill. It just overlooks Gloucester. I don't know if any of you sort of know this area. It's absolutely beautiful. So this is not the hill during the drought. I couldn't find a picture of it. Anyway, they started to notice that large hillsides essentially were dying away. And so they started to look in much more detail as to what was happening, in particular to the legumes, the white clover and the bird's foot trefoil. trefoil. And what they discovered, really, was this mechanism called cyanogenesis. And they found that there are two uh, important genes in the plants. And if you have both of them, you have a chance of surviving. But if you don't, you essentially um, uh, succumb to the, to the effects of heat stress. But the point about surviving is you survive by producing prussic acid. Just to let you realize that despite the fact that the drought only happened for those two years, they continued to go back for four years, and they could still literally see the effects of the drought on all of the plants, and in particular, these particular populations. So the nitrate toxicity is something which um, was, was sort of understood and was known, but this whole process was not really properly studied. It was seen as a kind of peculiarity amongst those plants, but as kind of awareness grew, people began to realize, well, actually, there's thousands of plants who have this mechanism of being able to literally turn on glycosides and cyanolipids. And it really starts to avoid tissue disruption. So this is really what the plant is doing. It's going through a biochemical process to protect itself inside. The challenge for the plant comes that when the rain comes back, and essentially the tissues start to swell up and it bursts, then a lot of the prussic acid is then released into the plant, which is not really what the plant needs. Basically, it kills it. So there's a kind of a short-term, long-term issue here about why did plants ever devise a concept of having cyanogenesis? 
What is worrying, though, is that sorghum, a very important crop for many parts of the world, and Sudan grass, cassava, and lima beans are all important foods that produce hydrogen cyanide. So uh, effectively, we're looking at some of our major crops having these mechanisms inside them. So for those of you who, who like chemistry, effectively it's part of the anabolic and catabolic processes. And then what they try to do, the plants, is they try to detoxify themselves. Once they've built up all the hydrogen cyanide, they need to find mechanisms to effectively rid themselves of it. But if they take on too much water and the tissues actually swell and the cells swell and they burst, they don't have the mechanism to clean themselves of it. Now, it's not just plants. It turns out that as people were looking into this, they found that arthropods, loads of insects, also produce or have cyanogenesis. And of course, why they have this is to avoid being um, eaten. It's basically an anti-predator reaction. So both in the plant world and in the insect world, we see this particular biochemistry going on. So it makes perfect sense. Um, and it's really something, in a way, that has been built in as part of a whole repertoire of defence compounds. <coughs> but as I say, when you're desperate and there's no other food to eat, and you see greenery, and in the case of Ethiopia it's called the green pea, and it's kind of a staple plant and thought to be safe, and therefore the poor definitely rely on it, you just don't imagine that a plant that's been your staple and has been safe for all those years can suddenly become poisonous for you. So what are we, what are we sort of thinking about? What are we actually going to do about it? Well, along comes another problem. Because along with the plants themselves adapting and essentially making themselves inedible and poisonous, there's a whole range of other organisms that rather quite like these conditions. And these are fungi and they produce mycotoxins. Now, the alarming thing about mycotoxins is that previously they were considered to be the downside of poor storage, slightly damp conditions where effectively fungi would get in and then this release of toxins would then contaminate vast areas of, of vast uh, stores of corn in particular, and particularly seeds as well, very, very susceptible to mycotoxin poisoning. But it turns out they also quite like drought conditions as well. And so what we've seen in the past uh, few years is that mycotoxins have started to spring up pretty much everywhere. Even a microgram can affect you badly. But where do they occur? Well, essentially, they come at us in two ways. So mycotoxins are really sitting in the soil, if I can try to paint a picture for you. But you know, a lot of our crops are sprayed with pesticides, like a phosphate, for example. And what that does is it knocks out part of the healthy soil flora and fauna. And the mycotoxin, the fungi that produce the toxins that we're worried about, actually start to take over. So glycophosate and, and other pesticides don't do us any favours because, in a sense, it prejudices the soil towards producing toxins. So we have three sort of main areas where mycotoxins start to turn up. So there's the fuminescence. Um, these are found in corn, a lot of processed food. So they're all out there, sort of churning away and producing all kinds of toxins. Then we have, afraid to say it, things in beer and wine. So, and why? Well, if you imagine you've got food, you've got feedstuff for your animals. You see it's slightly mouldy, so you think, oh, right, well, I'm not going to feed it to my animals. Of course I'm not going to. I, I care about my livestock. But then someone comes along who's making beer, and really, why not? So it turns out that when people analyse how the food chains and the supply chains go, um, that in some of the, what I might call the less well-crafted beers, the mouldy um, the, the mouldy seeds go into beer making, taking with them all the mycotoxins. Same with wine, I'm afraid. So uh, that's not really very good news for us. And then this last group, the zeolinones, are very, very worrying because 
How that works is that they essentially imitate estrogens. So the last thing you really want to be doing is to, you know, ingesting even more estrogens because we know that that has a whole range of impacts on humans. And in particular, it's been linked to obesity and to cancers. So we're being, in a sense, attacked from many, many angles. We're literally eating food that is contaminated, but at a level which we can manage. But during drought conditions, the other sort of more friendly fungi start to sort of fade away and, or they're, they're damaged by pesticides. And therefore, those that produce the mycotoxins come on. Now, aspergillus is one particular one. This is a very nice uh, image of that. But these molds, you'll know them as um, ear, there's, there's a whole variety of diseases which these spread from. And what we now know is that elevated carbon dioxide, raised temperatures, reduced and high humidity, as well as very patchy rainfall, all enhance the presence of these molds in soil and across the crop world. Now, remember what I keep saying, we have a very, very limited number of varieties of crops at our disposal in the main marketplace. Of the 70, what I would call, staple crops, that we, plants that we could eat, we really only go after four of them, you know, corn and rice and so forth. So we're really missing out here. And what we've done is we've kind of pushed ourselves down a channel and we've opened ourselves up to what we would call, in a sense, a poison chalice. We've actually got, on the one hand, the need for food, particularly in places like Sudan, Ethiopia, and so forth, but then it's contaminated. And so the challenge, I think, if you're sitting in a developing world, is if you are starving, what choices do you have? So the fungus produces the mycotoxins, all kinds of defense mechanisms, but nevertheless, it gets into the food chain and then, unfortunately, it gets released into our bodies. So that what we saw and what we're seeing, particularly for one of the compounds that comes out, aflatoxins, now they've been traced and they have huge and pervasive effects. I mean, it's just a very long quote, which I won't read out to you, but essentially they're known to create cancers, they have uh, teratogenic, they, they have just a whole range of really nasty things that they're going to do to us. The worst thing is they're found in dried fruits, in spices, in oil seeds, uh, cereals, corn, rice, milk. And, con and contamination can happen at any time. So it can happen through milk, it can, it can happen through seeds, um, and so on. And the thing is, and this is the worst part of it, aflatoxins are chemically and thermally stable. So you can cook, you can boil, you can fry, you can bake, you can do all those things, and the aflatoxins you know, come sailing through, ready to attack. It got so bad a couple of years ago that um, the concentration, and this is Dagoretti, it's a small suburb, it's not really a suburb, but it's a sort of an area surrounding Nairobi. As it said here, 41% of children were found to have aflatoxin poisoning. And it leads to cancers in later life, but also stunting and poor growth. And the worst thing is, because of the milk, a lot of pregnant women who take milk on because of protein were also exposed to aflatoxin. So you have this dilemma. People who are literally on the edge of starvation, certainly malnourished, having access to the crops that did make it through the drought, probably highly contaminated, and then the soil conditions compounding that, because as we've added more and more inputs, the soils themselves are not able to protect us and our food. So the whole food chain, the whole supply chain of clean and healthy food is really under attack. And this is not just a problem of the developing world. You can talk to farmers in America, <coughs> corn and maize farmers, they'll tell you the same thing. They'll tell you, of course, they have more interventions and they can put more pesticides in and they can put antibiotics in and they can put all sorts of things, antifungals and so forth. So they've got more technology at their disposal. But there comes a point when it's too expensive to actually try to protect the plants. And as they're encountering more and more droughts, dry periods and so forth, it becomes really, really a challenge. So even the most uh, well-resourced farmers are finding it a challenge. So here in Europe, 
we are certainly not immune to aflatoxin poisoning. And you can see here, even at two degrees, literally most of mainland Europe has got aflatoxin poisoning on the horizon. And it is happening already. So although this is a scenario going out 20 years, already we have aflatoxin across most of southern Europe. So you have to think about what food, where it's coming from, and so forth. And it certainly is happening here in the UK. So we have uh, a lot of surveillance. We have many, many um, tests. We have certainly food safety and security right up there at a high level. So people are in, in certainly in the institutions and in the various regulatory bodies very aware of this. But the challenge is we haven't got enough seed variety in our repertoire. And because we don't, essentially, we've gone down one particular channel. So I'm going to uh, try to give you, though, a more positive story. Because at this point, it's all looking very bad. And climate change is going to get worse. We're going to have more droughts and so forth. But all over the world, people who are, so to speak, disconnected from the commercial world of large-scale crops and all of the market pricing and so forth, they're in fact not necessarily suffering from these types of poisoning. So slowly, 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 a group of organizations all around have begun to understand that the traditional seed varieties that have been looked after for generations by many indigenous peoples are perhaps the source of our future, of a safe food future. And you can see from the variety of where these different organizations have given awards. So these are, this is actually a map of organizations that have recognized this and have begun to not only recognize it in, in nice words, but actually have begun to invest on the ground with traditional peoples and indigenous peoples, actually saying, you actually have a store cupboard that could save human life. You are the ones, you are the custodians, in a sense, of our future. Because it's not necessarily our future based on four crops and a tiny number of varieties. This is not actually going to see us through the century. So these organizations, including Coventry University, which is very nice, um, have taken the bull by the horns and decided to invest on the ground and try to make it possible for those communities to first and foremost be recognized and respected for the job of work they do, which is to protect and save many of the seeds that we will need. But then there comes a massive challenge. So let me just describe for you Ethiopia. So in Ethiopia, they import 500,000 metric tons of durum wheat to make pasta. It's a slightly odd thing, but anyway, there they are. 500,000 metric tons, that's an enormous amount of wheat to make pasta, durum wheat. So the very rich people in, in Ethiopia eat Italian pasta. The middle class eat Turkish pasta. And the very poorest people eat the durum wheat, which is basically the local wheat. So a group of scientists have been working on the ground and actually looking at this wheat. Because what they noticed is that the populations that have access and where there's been the possibility of avoiding the drought have shown no signs whatsoever of any cyanogenesis or any other problems. More than that, they're actually very, very healthy. So the picture I painted to you of the beginning where you saw the boy in the vast area with all the animals dying, and you see the same thing in Ethiopia, and I tell you that Ethiopia has the largest amount of food aid in the world. But then I tell you that underneath that, if you dig a little deeper, then you find populations and communities essentially living a very, very healthy life. So the researchers started to look at what they were growing and what they were eating. And what they discovered was that the durum wheat that they had, the seeds that they were growing, not only were they different from one part of the Ethiopian highlands to another, but they had actually been separate for many generations. And that there were big differences between all of these seeds. But the one 
clear feature of them was that they were drought resistant, higher yields than the mainstream, high nutritional value, and essentially just continued to produce against all the odds in a rain-fed agricultural setting. So very, very interesting. And then they tested the genetics and they found the same thing. So why, you wonder, wouldn't industry and the government jump at this? Well, it turns out that to organize a kind of highly disparate process of seeds, and it turns out you have to do something with these seeds, at a much, you have to process them at a much lower temperature than the, than the uh, mainstream ones. So you'd have to change the whole processing of wheat, which means that you would have to essentially take away all the subsidies and all of the industrial processes and switch them over to people who really are not part of the market economy, but are growing food for themselves. So you have to think about why would the government not actually want to do this? So there are large hurdles. But I, as you go further forward, and under something called the Sendai framework, which is how we're supposed to think about disasters in the future, instead of always reacting to them like a humanitarian crisis, instead build back better, try to put things in place that will take people through and have more resilience. Then you need to be reaching into a store cupboard of seeds that are not owned by a company, so they're not the property, the intellectual property of a company, but essentially which can be used and distributed albeit uh, freely, but certainly um, through a sort of global creative commons process. So open seed, we would call it. So that's where we are in the discussions. Now, in the UK, we have a very, very lively and active community. And what they've started to call it is seed sovereignty. So we talk a lot about sovereignty these days. So seed sovereignty. What it basically says is that seeds and biodiversity are part of the commons. They're part of public good. And what farmers' rights are is essentially is to be able to breed them and to exchange. So let's say I find someone over in another valley who has a seed variety that's doing extremely well in the drought conditions, and I have a variety that does well in wetter soils and wetter times, then if I'm a farmer, I should feel free to be able to exchange and to go into partnership with the farmer two values down. So here the idea is to have open source seeds, which can be exchanged freely, saved, they're not patented, they're not genetically modified, and they're not controlled by any of our major seed giants, as they're sometimes called, by this particular group. So it's a revolution that's needed. It will save us, that's for sure. It is something that we have to take very, very seriously. And you see small pockets of it beginning. In Scotland, for example, there's a lovely nursery which is growing, the, keeping the seeds of plants from Nepal and all over to grow herbs. Now, I don't really believe in sort of transporting things too far away from everywhere else. But as planet Earth is changing so fast, it is almost like we need to rethink our whole food supply. And what that requires us to do is to value the very seeds that are the heart of this. The plants that I'm going to show you in a short film now are very interesting because they managed to confront drought because we're talking about sorghum and many of the plants which sit alongside those that are essentially killing us. And these plants don't turn on the cyanogenesis. They have the genes, but essentially their normal physiology means that they can operate under far, far harsher conditions. So there's a, essentially a robustness, a resilience about some of these seed varieties, which makes them a much more likely bet going forward in the next couple of uh, decades. So I'm going to show you a, a clip from the end of a film. It's called The Seeds of Freedom. It's a lovely film. It's, it was narrated by Jeremy Irons, um, and it was produced by the Gaia Foundation, who are here in London. And they run an enormous effort around the world, but particularly in Africa, to try to gather around the concept of seed sovereignty. People who have, up until now, been considered really not very important, and really to bring them into the centre of this conversation and link them together so that they actually become the seed merchants, the master farmers 
of the next couple of decades. So I'm just going to show you the last uh, three or four minutes of the film. Touch the toil and sorrow in the soil Where the greenbacks never grow on what I borrowed Dig down and tell me where's my seed for tomorrow Dig your hand down in the land The agrochemical and GM industry claims that small-scale agroecological farming is backward and inefficient. But the reality is that in spite of the unrelenting pressures they face, it is these farmers who feed 70% of the world's population. These traditional farming systems use less land, less water and fewer resources. They grow healthy, nutritional food and nurture greater crop diversity. They protect soils, water and ecosystems and they are proving more resilient in the face of climate change. It is these farming methods that can show us the way forward for real food security. Ecological systems, localized, biodiverse, are the ones that are really providing food, nourishment, health and joy in eating for local communities. We need to de decentralize our food system and if we have to decentralize our food system, decentralized seed provisioning, seed sovereignty <coughs> must become very much central to food sovereignty. <laughs> If we don't take this opportunity, we are going to lose the city and lose the future. The future of all, the future of our children. So farmers around the world are coming together and are working for food sovereignty, the right for people to produce their own cultural food. <laughs> I don't think uh, the public should ever underestimate the potential power that they have should they choose to use it. You know, who would have thought that Murdoch and, and, and News Corp could have been brought low by, really by a, a sense of, of outrage. I think if we have a, a much bigger public debate around the kinds of agriculture that we want and the kinds of, of, of practices and techniques of some of those big uh, seed corporations, we might just get that same degree of, of outrage and hopefully uh, a system in the long term that's better for, for people and the planet. Then if we look at the ancestral way, we find the solution to rebuild what has been destroyed. So I'm sensing that in the conversations here in the UK, we're on a knife edge between, forget about Brexit and where we get our food from at the moment, but even if we were to be self-sufficient in food, we will have to rethink the kinds of seed varieties that we will need because we will have drought conditions. We will have conditions where the varieties that grow in the fields today are susceptible to aflatoxin are susceptible to cyanogenesis. And in a sense, thinking back to bird's foot trefoil, this will have an effect on our wildlife and many, many other things. Do we have store cupboards of seeds? Yes, we do. There are people here in London who are creating small little seed banks. There are people in Scotland, as I said. So if there's one thing I want to conclude on, it's learn about seeds, find out about them, find out what are the varieties, what ancient and traditional varieties we have, even for corn and maize and for a fodder. Because believe it or not, there is aflatoxin here in the UK, but it's by good grace, I would say, and good luck that we haven't had massive problems with it. But it is there in our food chains. And if you think about how we bring our livestock in and how we actually intensively feed them,
and then we put the mouldy grain in our beer. Um, you can imagine that a future where our food security and our food safety is perhaps not quite as, uh, quite as promised as I have thought in the past. So think about seed sovereignty. Think about what it will mean in the future and value, as I say, the very seeds that surround us and perhaps we just take for granted. Thank you very much. Thank you.